Hey, Life Groupers. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday. Today, uh, as we start this new unit, I just want to take the time to remind you what Life Groups are all about. I hope you can say it along with me by now. We've been doing it for a while. But the point of Life Groups is to provide a place for people to belong, believe, and become. Life Groups provide a place where people can connect with other people that are like them, that they can learn the truth of God's Word, and they can begin to be changed to become what God always wants them to be. And I can't be everywhere. Tom can't be everywhere. Matt can't be everywhere. And so uh, in that same vein, you can't be everywhere either, but you can do for a few what none of us can do for everyone. So just work at being present in the lives of the people in your life groups and welcome them and be encouraging to them. We're starting a new unit. It's the second half of Genesis, uh, starting in chapter 27. But our time this week will be brief because of the churchwide business meeting that's going to start at 930 in the worship center. And that will probably dismiss in 15 or 20 minutes or so, and then you'll have the rest of your class time. And we've encouraged you guys to do more of a fellowship time, but you may want to do a bit of an overview about Genesis because there's a lot of things to take in. Not Maybe not necessarily go over the lesson uh, this week, but just some of those broad things about Genesis that they can keep in the back of their mind and then go over some of the backstory to get them in the right frame of mind for what we'll be studying here in the lives of Jacob and Joseph. Here's the overview of Genesis. It's the beginning of the biblical story of God as creator, human beings as his creation made in God's image, but then fallen. And then God's response to that through a redemptive creation of his chosen people and doing so through all kinds of circumstances some good some bad despite the faults of his people he continues to use them to redeem his people back to himself the opening word of Genesis is in the beginning and that's how the book is titled in Hebrew is in the beginning and it serves as the title but it also tells us what the book is about the book is about beginnings it's the beginning of God's story creation, human disobedience, and God's redemption. But it's also the story of the beginning of God choosing and making a covenant with people through he will bless then the rest of the world. And this narrative in Genesis comes in two parts. The first part is almost what we would call prehistory. It's like uh, those first 12 chapters of Genesis. And then the story of where redemption begins through Abraham and his descendants. It can be hard to, in reading the Old Testament narratives, to discern what does that mean for us today. And so I'm just going to share a little bit about just kind of an overview of how we read Old Testament narratives, because we wouldn't read them the same way that we would read, say, James, where James is very directive and practical. It's not always clear what God is, what truth God is actually teaching us in an Old Testament narrative. And so I'm going to share with you guys just a few pointers from an outstanding book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. So as you read the book of Genesis, uh, be aware that even though it seems like these stories are about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, God is ultimately the protagonist of the story. Above all else, the story is his story. In our section of Genesis, there's a couple of subplots to watch out for. Uh, both of them are crucial to the whole Bible story. Uh, the first one is the story of the covenants between God and his people. The first is that God will never cut off life on the earth. He made this covenant or this promise with Noah, and through it, it extends to all of humankind. The second one is with Abraham, promising him two things. The first one is the gift of the seed, uh, who will become a great nation to bless all the other nations, and then the gift of land. The second covenant is repeated to Isaac, it's repeated to Jacob, and in turn it serves as the basis for the rest of the Old Testament, the gift of the law and the gift of kingship. The other thing to watch out for in, in uh, Genesis and, our, and what we're watching for is God's choice of the younger or the weaker or the most unlikely to bear the righteous seed. Uh, this is a huge breach of ancient Near Eastern culture. Uh, it's unheard of in their day and time by bypassing the birthright of the firstborn son. But God continues to do this in Genesis. It wasn't Cain who received the blessing, but Seth. It's not Ishmael who receives the blessing, but Isaac. It's not Esau, but Jacob. It's not Reuben, but Judah. 
And as you read through this uh, section of the Bible, you'll find various threads that hold the larger thread together. So through this subplot, you'll see a couple of things. One, God's faithfulness to his people, despite their repetitive unfaithfulness to him. And then God's choice of the lesser and unfavored ones uh, over the favored or expected or the strong. And I think that kind of gets echoed in the New Testament what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, that God chooses the weak to shame the strong. And these are those matters that make all these tiny stories one big story. And so be watching for that. What is the thread that ties all of these stories that we're going to read each and every week together? And remember, it's God's story. It's not about Isaac. It's not about Jacob. It's God's story. So let's get into some specifics about uh, Jacob this week in Genesis 27. Just a couple of caveats for you as we read these Old Testament narratives. We need to be very careful to make sure that these narratives, they're not allegorical. or They're not stories that have hidden meaning in them. Uh, there are parts of Scripture that are allegorical, uh, parts of Ezekiel, or parts of Revelation, but it's very clear that they're being used in that way. They're easily to identify. These Old Testament narratives, they're not intended to teach a moral lesson, so be very careful that you don't moralize out of them. Uh, they're written to show the progress of God's redemption over his creation, not to illustrate specific moral principles. And in that same vein, you can't misappropriate the text or don't personalize the text. Uh, Jacob deceiving his father to get the blessing is not God telling you that you need to be more honest. Uh, that, that kind of view takes the, what the text is trying to say out of context. You've got to stay focused on what God's doing. Here's an example I'm going to use from 2 Samuel about this. There are, there are implicit teachings in the scripture and then there are explicit teachings. Teachings. In 2 Samuel, there's not a statement, there's not that explicit statement that David committed adultery and because so he was wrong. There's not any statement like that in that entire story about David and Bathsheba. There is a statement in verse 27 that God says that he is displeased with David, but we don't know why. Is it because of the adultery? Is it because he had Uriah murdered? Is it because he brought Bathsheba into his house? We're not really told. It's not explicit. But, as followers of God, we are expected to know that what he was doing is wrong, that adultery is wrong, because it's explicitly taught other places in the Bible, specifically Exodus chapter 20. So today, the province of our lesson in Genesis 27 is about deception. Uh, that's ultimately what Jacob's name means, is deceiver. It's in his character, it's how he gets through life. Uh, some people, they just kind of plow ahead when they face obstacles. Some people fight. Uh, some people lay down. But Jacob, when he faces adversity, he becomes a con man. And this trait is not something that he has just out of the blue. It's a part of his family soup. Uh, God says many times in Scripture that the sins of the father will carry on to the third and even fourth generation. And we can really see that in Jacob's life. It, this deception started with Abraham and his dealings with Melchizedek and others. And, and Sarah, and here in our story today, we find Rebecca doing the exact same thing. How can I swindle people to get what I want? Maybe a little bit of background is necessary, and maybe this is what you just go over with your class. You're going to find it's helpful to understand what's going on in Genesis 27, that you need to read Genesis 25, 19 through 34, and maybe a little bit of 26, maybe 26, 34, and uh, 35. And then all of chapter 27 will help make what's going on in our assigned passage today make sense. You'll obviously need to summarize these statements about how Esau uh, was tricked and gave away his birthright, and then how that immediately plays into our story today, but also the promise that God gave Rebecca. Because here's what I think is going on. Based on Rebecca's character that we see elsewhere in Genesis, I think that we can interpret her actions here as being commendable. I think it's a sincere desire to do the right thing to make sure that Isaac's blessing falls on the divinely chosen, less rash, less impulsive, more responsible of her two sons. That's her apparent motivation is to honor the promise that God gave her in Genesis 25-23. But her motivation seems good, but her method demonstrate a lack of faith in God. And in this, she reminds us of Sarah who tried to obtain what God promised to her, 
uh, illegitimately, namely by having Abraham have a son with her servant, Hagar. And you can read that in Genesis 16. Rebecca tries to pull the wool over Isaac's eyes. But we also see in the story that may her character may have had noble intentions. Jacob is clearly less concerned with doing the right thing. The morality of these actions of his mother's suggestion, he's more concerned about what would happen to him if he's discovered and the falsehoods revealed. So I think we can kind of get a clear glimpse of Jacob's heart at this moment. There is a lot to say about Esau, his nature, his character, and Isaac and Jacob and his nature and his character. In our guidebook today in, in Explore the Bible kind of pushes us toward talking about deception and, and human beings' ability to deceive and how we respond to that. But I think really what this is about is about trust. Rebecca had God's promise to her. She just didn't think that he could do it. And so she said, I've got to figure out a way to make this happen. God needs a little bit of nudging on my part. And so I think trust is the issue. The trust is the belief that someone or something is honest, reliable, or effective. And it's just our first sinful nature to not trust God, to attempt to engineer our circumstances to get what we want, or to believe that our path is better than his path. And so just a couple of questions you can ask your class, maybe just to think through, because this is not a single instance in Jacob's life. We're going to see more and more deception from him in the weeks to come. But ask your class, how do we trust God more? Where are we not trusting God in our own lives? In What's something that we can do together as a class to help one another uh, to trust God more? And, and it may be something with finances. It may be something with our kids. It may be uh, just, just something with life. But how can we help each other to put our trust in God and not in, in other things? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path, or He will make your path straight. And so, this is a class say, how can we do this? How can we cry out to God and say, we trust you? Well, it's a short lesson, uh, so you're not going to have a lot of time. So there's just a few things where maybe you can just uh, get the ball rolling to help speed us through uh, to next week. And please let me know if there's anything that I can do for you. Just want to let you know that we pray for you. Life group leaders each and every week on Wednesday night during our prayer meeting. And so if you need anything, let me know. But that, Godspeed.